This episode of Techzilla is sponsored by Brain Tonic, the United States Air Force, and GoDaddy.com. Coming up on today's show, DirecTV hacks, how not to get hosed when you're buying a cheap PC, and the usual stack of viewer questions. So kill that engine, shift into neutral, and coast to the couch, because Techzilla starts now. Welcome to Techzilla, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Garnet Lee. Veronica is traveling for a day job to Amsterdam. I had no idea console gaming was so popular there, so we asked our good friend and executive editor of OneUp.com, Garnet Lee, to stop in and help us out. Oh, of course, Patrick. You know I'm always glad to be here for you guys. I'm, I'm glad always you're fun. here. I'm sorry we couldn't send you to Amsterdam. We couldn't send Veronica. Veronica went to Amsterdam. Well, she's up there last time. She's checking out Killzone 2. So that's pretty awesome stuff. You know, it is like the era of the shooters right now for holiday season. So there's plenty of that, right? What's the, the what's going on? Like the middle of October to to the end of November, there's like 275,000 <laughs> game releases. You, you know, it's nothing new. You've been around the gaming scene before. You know, this happens every year. We get a bunch of games out in the in the fall. They actually they're coming out a little earlier because what right. the retailers have realized is they got to get them out early enough that they can start selling them into stores. And so you guys can go out and buy them. You know, what happens is the buzz starts hitting. People start talking about it. We start playing them online. You're the enthusiasts. All that, all that builds up into great sales for them. <laughs> it's all about manipulating the sales. Manipulating the sales. I, we have a question for you, actually. We wanted to ask you about the new Xbox 360. So we got a new update coming out in a week. Right, the new or Xbox so. experience. It's awesome. If you not, if you haven't checked it out, right? No. Oh, so okay. So if you've seen, you've seen, do you have a 360 first of all? I have access to a 360. Okay, so you know how it has that flat, that flat interface with the blades that slide back and forth. Right. It's kind of, you know, it's very functional, but it's not exactly the most beautiful thing in the world. Well. When you switch to the new experience, first of all, everyone's gotten hung up on these avatars they have, and they're like, they're like the Wii people, and I, and I don't know that I'm that excited about that. What's cool about this new interface is that it's very easy to navigate through. Mm -hmm. It uses the same sort of uh, ideal, like you know, functional idea as the PS3 interface, where it's a crossbar. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. This, this, I've known you for a few years. This is the first time I've ever heard you or anybody else refer to the PS3 interface as functional. Or did you say functionality and I just misheard No, it is, it is actually functional. You know, I don't really love it that much, but you have to admit that if you're using a, a, a device that's a controller with right. sticks, not a keyboard, not a mouse, but with sticks, and you're manipulating on axes, then having two axes that you're going across okay. is actually the right way to do it, I right? Can buy it. Yeah, no, no, I can buy that. And, and it's used in a bunch of other devices. Windows Media Center uses right. it. And, and Because it works. Okay. Right, so it works. And so they've kind of done that, except they've done it in a 3D space. So you have panels that you're flipping through vertically, and then, then they recede off into three dimensions space and you can flip through them that way. Because I always thought the blades were a lot more functional than the basic PS3 interface. Well, so what happens with the blades is they have so much uh, content that they put into the system that they didn't anticipate originally that they become overloaded. So yeah, now what happens right. is the blades were a good idea, right? You could go to a blade. Except they're all like a sixteenth of an inch and there's 275,000 of them now. Well, or you keep on having to burrow down further and right. further and further into them. So what happened was you were selecting through a lot of menus on the individual blades as opposed to just moving through content. And that's really, it's kind of kludgy when you're not using a pointy device. You know, mm -hmm. with a mouse where you can point and select, oh, I want to pick that, I want to pick that, right. I want to pick that. It's easy. But when you're flipping through with sticks, <laughs> click, 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 exactly. click, 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 Okay, now I can listen to my MP3. Exactly. So it works a lot better now. They've also got a major easier system for managing your games. Right. So for instance, if you're into Gears of War 2 now, you'll be able to pull up Gears of War 2, flip through the panels, you'll be able to see the content you can get for the game. Oh, nice. You won't have to, it won't be like, oh, I have to go into the store and look up Gears of War 2 and then find out what the latest content is. You go to the game, you flip to the next panel, it shows you the downloads you can get. So cool. if your friend's playing a new map pack, you just go there download it, boom, whatever. So Easy. you're excited. Yeah, and Netflix integration. Streaming Netflix. I like that thought. Which I, I already just, started playing with. I just wish Netflix had more movies. No matter what platform, streaming Netflix is great, I just wish they had more movies on, period. Well, you know what? I don't think, it's, for me, it's not a movie service. It's right. a catch-up on my TV service. So mm -hmm. it's like using it sort of like a PBR, right? Because okay. I already loaded up a bunch of seasons of The Office on it. And, and the interface is great because I can actually go in and right. choose which episodes I want. And I can, I can stop watching whenever I want to, pick right back up where I left off. And the quality, okay, so I have 3,000 down, 1,500 up DSL, and I'm not getting HD even though HD is rumored to be hitting with the new, with the new update. And we've seen it actually in the right. office where we have a T3, we get HD speed. But when it assesses my, my uh, bandwidth, it gives me near HD. I mean, it's giving me true widescreen. Right. It's giving me true widescreen. It looks, it looks, how about this? I will willingly admit that my, my direct TV setup at home is still a SD setup, despite the fact I have an HD TV. <laughs> I know, I'm just lazy, right? It's so old school. I know, it's kind of old school. But, but it still looks better than that. So it looks better than upscaled SD. 
Looks good. Well, that's something. Random subjects for a thousand garnet. What do you think of Dead Space? And more specifically, what do you think of the gravity boots in Dead Space? The gra How's that for a loaded question? What wow. do you think of the gravity boots as a function of the video game Dead Space? Well, so actually the coolest part right. of Dead Space is the open 3D combat when you're in zero gravity. Right. So the gravity boots are pretty cool. They allow you to bounce around, but I'm, I'm, I have a feeling this is a loaded <laughs> question. Roger's like, you gotta ask him what he thinks about the gravity boots, because we just did an episode of System where we basically built magnetic boots for uh, for David Calkins, my co-host, so we can oh, basically no. get him to walk upside down on a steel plate. And it worked? We'll show you the episode. Just, hey, just check out System next I week. totally want to play with the boots. Well, <laughs> that could be arranged. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, by the way, guys, it didn't work. So enough of your uh, inner show no, no, promotions. No, 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 Obviously, no, no, no. it didn't work. We already know, fail. No, 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 no. We, we have him upside down moving around. Okay. It's just, well. How many, how many trips to general? Uh, zero. Oh, excellent. Way to go, dude. You yes, you my years that. as a spotter in gymnastics. All right, enough of my gratuitous inner show promotions. Shall we answer some questions? Let's do it. All right, our first email comes from Tom, who has a problem with his wife and two toddlers. Okay, he writes in, he says, my wife and two toddlers can't put CDs and DVDs back in their cases. So he's going to be ripping all the DVDs for the iPhone and Apple TV. Now I'm looking for an app that will find the cover art that isn't available on iTunes. If it found movie cover art, that would be worth some major cash for me. I'm on a Mac. Any ideas? Oh boy, I, album like finding album art or cover art is like an entire subcategory at Lifehacker. <laughs> And well, it's, it's that's an excellent article, actually. We're going to have that in the show notes, right? There's like 15 articles there. But there's one that collects all of them, where he like did a really, does a really good job. It has all the lists down at the bottom of all the links. So I, think I don't know that's if it was he reference. or if it was Gina Trapani. I mean, if, you, yeah. if you've never been to Lifehacker, go to Lifehacker. It's amazing, lifehacker.com. I've been playing around with TuneUp Media, but it's a Windows uh, application only until this fall. It probably doesn't do DVDs. I haven't had a chance to play around with that. And it can be a little flaky with things like soundtracks and collections, where there are lots of different artists on one album. I mean, the thing is, though, like, album covers are just one small part of tune-up, which will give you concert listings for an artist, clean up bad metadata, stuff like that. Um, you can check out Media Monkey, but again, it's a Windows application, but that does a great job of dealing with the metadata for your MP3s, your DVDs that you've ripped. But it's also Windows only. <laughs> and it's like, you can try, I mean, album cover finder on the Mac might work, uh, album art thingy 1.9 might work, because I've used all of these for CD covers. But for DVDs, it's a little different. <laughs> See, I haven't done DVD covers, so I'm out right. of my league a little bit on that one. I'm a music guy, so I've used uh, primarily the one that Roger showed us, MP3 tag. Yeah. And MP3 tag works great because it cleans up your metadata, it lets you customize any of the fields as you want to, and it gives you multiple sources, including like Amazon and, and, and another cover art source to get your cover art, and it embeds it into the tags. I mean, I've got like, I think of just over five or 600 hours, because I'm basically digitizing my entire CD collection again, so I got about 400 albums done. Again? Again, it's a long story. Okay. Um, it's, it um, always is with Patrick. Yeah, let's just skip past <laughs> that part. But I gotta be honest with you, every time I try an automated tool, I end up getting annoyed and going back to the classics. Doing it manually, right clicking, dragging. AllCDCovers.com, Amazon.com, CDCovers.cc, and of course, just Googling for the name of the album, because even like the, you know, iTunes does a pretty good job if you know, if you, you, you sign into your, your, your account, and it does a pretty good job of finding Albums, but it all—it always gives me like these weird like advertising See, images. Really, I haven't had good luck with it at all. For me, I have not gotten good album cover art off of off of iTunes. As a matter of fact, I find that it misses a lot of them. MP3 it does miss a lot of them. But it's I'm like, like it, how do you not know this? I ripped it. The meta tags are there. Everything's there. Why do you not know what I'm talking about? Well, what's also really frustrating is if you've got like a classic album, right? And right. for some reason, it gives you like I don't know the three in one double value twentieth <laughs> century artist pack instead of the original that? album cover. You're like no. I don't want the ghetto covered. Which I guess we, we, we're both kind of saying there's third party programs that work okay. I still think you're probably going to end up Google searching and manually. I just think the, the best results are going to be if you actually manually search this stuff out and place just it. Just like you want to use Lame right. to make your MP3s, you want to go search your stuff yourself and put in what you want. It will be better in the long run. You'll be happier. Plus, you, yeah, because there's nothing worse than finding out it's actually like a 45 pixel by 45 pixel oh. image image, and you couldn't tell that from yeah. the sample that was on the application. And then you're looking at it. And it you look way cooler, man. You pull out your you pull out your player, and you be like, nice. Yeah, it's good. It looks people, nice. People look at you go on the bus. They go, wow, that's that's all right. Yeah. You've got album art for all of it. You know, we should talk about is actually how to integrate your album art with your MP3 files so that no matter where you drag them to, 
no matter what application well, they'll work. That's what the one. That's why I use MP3 tag because it's a, it's actually a tag program, oh, and so the artwork cool. is simply part of the tagging. So it's actually it's dumping all that into the tag data. I that's why my, I like it. It's simple. My my home theater machine at home, we like weeping softly now because it's going to be running yet another application. Very lightweight. Okay. MP3tag.de. I like it. How about a quick message from one of our sponsors, Brain Tonic. Brain Tonic is the world's first think drink. It contains exactly zero caffeine and zero processed sugar and contains no chemical preservatives, just fuel for the cranium, making it highly effective for increasing mental clarity. The mental focus powers come from two herbs and two natural compounds, and it's sweetened only with organic agave nectar. Brain Tonic is the antidote to head fog. It was made by and for people who understand the role that health plays in accomplishing one's life vision. Place an order of Brain Tonic online at www.braintonic.com and be sure to use the coupon code R3 for a discount anytime you purchase. Be like Veronica Belmont, drink Brain Tonic, be smarter. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week's pick, Insider. We've been using NetStumbler to search out and inventory Wi-Fi access points for years, but it hasn't been actively developed in years, and it doesn't work so well in a Vista world. Enter Insider, an open source Wi-Fi network scanner that runs on XP and Vista if you have .NET 2.0 and just about any Wi-Fi card. Installed on a machine with a Wi-Fi adapter, an Insider provides a graph detailing the signal strength of various Wi-Fi points in the area. Over time, it allows you to highlight multiple access points simultaneously so you can track how strong they are as you move around the space, and you can filter out access points or group items by MAC address, SSID, channel RSSI, and last time seen. It might not sound like much, but if you need to troubleshoot a Wi-Fi installation, determine signal strength in various locations in a building, or track down an open WAP when you're on the road, Insider is your application for Vista and XP. All right, Garnet, you got the one-up thing, you got the videos there. You're pretty big on getting basically gaming videos and putting them up on the internet. Yeah, bet, man. I mean, everybody wants to see the latest games, especially, especially now that they all look so good, right? And there's a whole sort of subculture about, look what I did in this video game, or look what I did in that video game. Sure, cheats, glitches, all that kind of stuff. You got it. Game videos, that's where we're at. So you ready for a question from Kiernan? Let's hit it. He's in Ireland, and he's interested in doing a video gaming show. He writes in, what is the easiest way to capture gameplay on a PS3 or in an Xbox 360 for uploading to Vimeo in HD? He also wants to know if we could do a how-to on homebrewing a PSP and if the latest 5.0 firmware for the PSP is compatible with homebrew. Okay, do you want to do homebrew or HD capture first? Well, let's do the HD capture first, okay? okay? Because the homebrew thing is a long answer. But Kieran, and what you want on the capture card is very simple. You go to Blackmagic Design, they have this product called the Intensity. Intensity. And I understand you guys have looked at this thing before. We've had great luck with it. You guys have the cool guy insider <laughs> buddies with the whole scene debug uh, PS3s that don't have HTCP locks on the HDMI output. So the trick here is that the, of the two cards, and there are two cards you're going to see there, you want the one that has the component inputs because that way you can still do up to 720p. Right. And you won't get caught with the HDMI lockout. So you'll be in great shape there. And the nice thing about the card is it's recognized natively both in Final Cut Pro and in Adobe Premiere. So you drop it in, you start capturing, you're right in your editing program, and away you go, you'll be able to make videos in no time at all. That's really simple. It's exciting. And you could also try to develop a relationship with like Sony Europe to try to get one of the cool guy debug units. Well, right. I think once you get out there and start <laughs> doing some show, shows, you'll be recognized and people want to talk to you. And yeah, if you can get the debug, then you can go HDMI. And that's even, I mean, that's really cool because you're full digital. It's like right there. It's shiny. It's pretty. It's Yeah, it's exciting, right? It's like, oh, oh it's HDMI. Stuff. Check it out. Now, what exactly is homebrew? I like it. You're joking with me. Patrick's joking with me in the, in, in the cut between the scenes, and he's like, well, you know, does that make your PSP good? PSP is already good. Yeah, the PlayStation paperweight. It holds <laughs> down paper. Ever, I lo you Loco played Roco. Loco Roco. That's the last. I was obsessed with Loco Roco. I finished it. I've been waiting for another, you know. There's a sequel coming. A sequel coming, okay. so you're in good shape. Homebrew is a whole other subject, and we could do a Techzilla like for the entire show about homebrew. So let me boil down to this to a couple of things. First of all, you're going to have to go to a non-official firmware. And there's a process to getting that flashed. And if you check out the website for Dark Alex or the PSP Wiki, right. they have a long set of instructions. But you're going to need a couple of things. First of all, you're going to have to buy a special battery. It's called the Pandora battery. Or there's actually a new name for it. It's called the Tool battery. And the, it basically, That's the one that allows you to start futzing with the firmware. Right. What it does is it lets you put the PSP into service mode. And once you have it in service mode, you're going to have to take a memory stick 
and load that onto your P and, and load some software onto it. Right. And then you have to go through the process of flashing your PSP, and now you've got new firmware on there. The new <laughs> yes, sir. What does the new firmware allow me to do? It sounds so exciting. <laughs> I've, I've trudged uphill to school in the snow both ways to put the new firmware. I got to tell you, the main reason a lot of people switched to this new firmware right. is that one of the developer things that Sony did was they enabled the ability to play PS1 games on the PSP, right? But they did it proprietarily, so, that you right. could, so you could go to the PlayStation Online Store, you could get these games and download, you paid like eight dollars for them, you could play them on your PSP. But a lot of people are like, well, hey, hmm, they figured out how to run these games on here, there must be some code underneath the hood that works now that, that lets them do that, right? Why would I pay for these games a second or third time when I can right. access my brilliant collection or some online collection? So if you heard a little toy called IsoBuster. I'm wondering what it's all about. <laughs> okay, IsoBuster is basically a program that lets you rip the code off of a PS1 disc and uh, it will, you have to have the original disc. I mean, no, I'm just like, I'm just like, it's just like, I, I love the fact that it's like, I'm gonna go through all this work so I can play like Nintendo 64 or PS1. No, no, no. Games. You'll be able to play. You'll be able to play Final Fantasy VII right there on your PS1. You'll be able to play whatever PS or PSP, any PS1 game. You'll be able to play on your PSP. There's also a homebrew community. There's people who have done emulators for different platforms. But there's also people who are doing like literally right. ground up original games for the PSP in oh, the scene. Oh, cool. So the, it's gonna allow you to be able to run code. Also play PS1 games and also do some fun stuff with it, you know, like video output and that kind of thing. If you don't have the video output, but is it really worth doing? I mean, I guess that's a question you have to ask. It's a cool scene. There's also a Wii homebrew scene. Yeah. It's like, you know, no, I mean, like, if you want to geek out, definitely do it. There's no real way to damage your thing because you can always just put the new firmware back on. You, can you can you brick your PSP? Well, anytime you're flashing firmware, you have an opportunity to brick a device, I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, but, but like, is, is it likely, is, you know, is, is, is likely? Sony going to pull an Apple and, you know, do a firmware that detects it and turns your PSP into a paperweight, or? I don't think they'll do one like that, because what happens is once you flash to the new firmware, right. then you're operating outside Sony's purview anyway. So unless you go back to the Sony official firmware, right. you're on the homebrew software, okay. right? So it, it, you'll still be able to play PSP games. There's some, there's, there's lots of different firmwares, and each firmware comes with an FAQ that tells you what it does and doesn't work with. The it, PlayStation Network I'm actually thinking. Is I'm actually thinking about, no, I'm thinking about doing this, because there are some PS1 games that actually would be able to Oh, and it's awesome. Like it works play. great. And as a matter of fact, one of the things you can do, is, there's a couple of programs then for convert. This is a long show, man. I'm telling you, like <laughs> we could go into this for a long time. It's a, it sounds like an episode of systems. You want to come do an episode of systems? We could do an episode of systems. We could we could break this thing down because another layer of this is then you have to have the software that takes the PS1 game and turns it into a PSP compatible read file. And what they've done is they've pulled the software out of the PSP that runs PS1 games and dumped it into the computer program. It's time for another video email. This one's from Young Alexander. Gotta love me. Yeah, this is, I gotta admit, this is one of the more obscure questions we've done in a while, but it was a baby. How can you say no? Plus, well, I got the sympathy for the dad with the baby and the time killing. If I'm following along here, Alexander, or I guess his dad, wants to play PC games on an old Power Mac G4 over a network. So it's, right. I'm not getting the idea that like he wants to take the G4 and somehow network into the PC. Well, you could try. I mean, if it's if you're talking about time killer type games, Sudoku or, or stuff that isn't like three right. D three D video games, you're done. It's in that case. If it's three D games, if it's shooters, if it's stuff like that, it's time to track down a flea sleep sack for Alexander and a space heater, or move the XP box upstairs. Um, he could try remote desktop connection client for Mac, which. I think your Mac is new enough to actually have support under that. He's going to need uh, Windows XP Pro or Windows XP Media Center Edition to get okay. the connectivity options. I mean, there's there's a bunch of options. I mean, you could try Go to My PC. There's there's 42 zillion programs that allow you to tunnel in and access the desktop I'm on Mr. the Norton. PC. Mr. I I have I have an alternative. Okay. Why not just buy a couple of older games that work on your G4? And Blizzard's you could play Diablo on that. You could play StarCraft. You could play StarCraft on that. As a matter of fact, I have StarCraft loaded up on an old G4 laptop. That's exactly like what he's talking about, and I actually play it a lot when I'm out on the road. Because StarCraft is fun. It's a great game. 
It's, it, it's aged very well, and it runs in a Mac native, so you don't even have to worry about anything. That would be a good thing, because you could try Q Emulator, um, you know, basically, which is going to... Q Emulator is pretty cool, because it'll allow you to run Linux or Windows on the G4 Mac. You'll need a set of Windows or Linux install disks. It's free, uh, especially compared to virtual PC, but it's not going to run any PC applications fast, so probably finding a native application is yeah. a good idea, or moving the XP box upstairs. Well, that's the alternative. Or, or play your games downstairs when you want to, and, you know... But he wants to play with the baby, because they're it. happy together when they're playing. I understand when you got like a little baby and the vibe and the keyboard, it's totally cool. Bejeweled too, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, Alexander, we're helping your dad out here with a few ideas there. If you want to get your 15 seconds of internet fame, do us a favor, send us a video here at Techzilla. All you got to do is record yourself or your baby, as the case may be, in front of a video camera asking a question no longer than 15 seconds. Upload the video to YouTube and email us a link to that YouTube video with video question in the subject line. Please do not directly email us video attachments. They will choke our servers and the IT people will come beat us with sticks, which hurts. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors here on Techzilla. It's GoDaddy.com. If you want to make an impact online, do us a favor, do it with GoDaddy.com. They got what you need, starting at less than $5 a month. Web hosting from GoDaddy.com includes 99.9% .9 uptime, 24-7 support, and free access to GoDaddy Hosting Connection, the place to quickly install over 50 free applications like WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, OS Commerce, and quite a few more. GoDaddy.com makes it easy to customize your own virtual dedicated server. Choose one of three popular plans or select your own Linux or Windows server with all the plan options you need. And if you're in Canada, GoDaddy recently started registering .ca domain names. So if you're looking to do the Canadian website thing, they have you covered and we've got you covered. We've got a deal for you. Enter in code TECH4, that's T-E-K-4 when you check out. You're going to score an additional 15% off any order of $75 or more. Some restrictions do apply. Please see GoDaddy.com for details. And do us a favor here at Techzilla. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or doggone it, just too darn irresistible. This week's pick is a classic. It's HomestarRunner.com. Immerse yourself in the world of Strong Badia, Population Tire, where you'll meet Homestar Runner, Strong Bad, Marzipan, The Cheat, and the rest of the gang. They've got all the short animations, cartoons, interactive features, and flash-based games to keep you occupied for days on end. The most popular section, of course, is the Strong Bad emails, unless, of course, you're into the answering machine. In just a few short minutes, Strong Bad answers viewers' emails in his usually smart alecky manner. These emails usually take a tangent, bringing in other characters and situations. And in some cases, if you're lucky, you'll find yourself subjected to one of Strong Bad's original tunes, such as Everybody to the Limit or The System is Down. Full of pop culture satire and clever inside jokes, HomestarRunner.com is sure to leave you snickering and begging for more. Garnet, it seems we've seen an increase in the number of folks with PC gaming questions. You mean like Angel out in DC who writes us and says, I'm planning on spending $3,000 to $4,000 on a gaming PC and was wondering, which is the best bang for my buck? I know, I know, right? Three thousand to four thousand dollars. That's a lot of gaming PCs. That is a whole lot of gaming PCs. That's like PC. a gaming PC and an HDTV and a surround sound I know. system. So let's hear the rest of his question. But okay. I mean, we'll, we'll get to the answer okay. because I think one of our answers for you is you don't need to spend near that much money. But yeah. he says, I know Dell owns Alienware, but I'm wondering if I get any benefit from going with either company. If there's a third or fourth better PC gaming site option, and then I'd like to know. Angel in Washington, D.C. All right, he brings up a, a good point. Dell has its own gaming line, the XPS 630 and the 730. They which, also own which right Alienware. There. Hold on a second. Before we go anyplace else, XPS 630, and, and I, I mean, I have no connections to Dell. XPS 630 is an amazing bargain for the buck. I don't think you could... I don't think you could buy from like ZipZoom Fly right. or Newegg the pieces and build that computer. It would be well. The It'd thing, be close. It would. It, it's really. I mean, it's it's really really hard to buy your own parts and build a machine for less than somebody like Dell or HP or Gateway or anybody who's buying in well, huge volumes. At the low end. At now, the if low you're end. Going, if you're going super high end, you are going to save some money when you start assembling the pieces yourself. But. I don't. I don't think you need. You know, unless you're really into like bragging rights. And right. If you're into bragging rights, then you want to build your own hot rod. Yeah, a three I mean, to four thousand dollar machine is one of the things. Like you mentioned, a bunch of boutique vendors. Um, you know, Alienware is the one that was bought by Dell. I mean, the performance difference. Parts are parts these days. Some yep. of them are tweaked. Some of them are tweaked by the manufacturer, which is great. Voodoo PC, which is bought by HP. Falcon Northwest is still hanging in there. Um, but once you once you pick a, an expensive pile of parts. 
it's, you know, you're pay a lot of what you're paying for is the layout of the cables and how pretty the box is itself. Um, so I gotta say, if you're looking for bang for your buck, don't buy a boutique gaming PC because you're buying a pretty case and hopefully decent cable management inside of it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think the options probably are, you know, that Dell is a great machine, the 630. There's mm -hmm. lots of options on that one. And, and we then, should point out that we, we, you know, Dell provided the machines for the set. Okay. I, I've been buying Dell machines for years. Two of the machines in my house are Dell's, so, you know, but HP makes good machines. Okay, so they also have the Blackbird, HP does, and they have an air cool Which version. is really expensive. No, it's not. The air-cooled version is not really expensive. Oh, so the non-water-cooled one. Exactly. So the Blackbird, you've probably seen the very fancy version that has water cooling and you know like a three or four thousand dollar price tag. They make it. They just lowered the price, as a matter of fact. Oh, Eighteen cool. hundred bucks for the air-cooled version. Very cool. It's got a great processor. It's got a great video card. It's loaded up. It's ready to go. Same deal. Yeah, I, I think you're getting this from both of us. Fourth, you know, in times of economic trauma, <laughs> while we're all for spending the money for America, man, four grand is an insane amount of money for a gaming machine, even if you're getting a massive 24, 30 inch monitor. Buy, buy a, a great monitor. System. Yeah. Buy some games to play on it and stash the rest in like a CD because you know what? A year from now, you're gonna want another new gaming machine. Yeah, or you know, buy a used car or something. I mean, <laughs> for, I mean, just four, at this point, $4,000 is a, epic pile of cash for a gaming PC unless you like the bragging rights that go with the shiny well, right. case. And then that's a whole other subject. Yeah. And if you're doing that, I mean, back back to the boutique builders. And they make shiny toys and they charge you a lot for them. Oh, and by the way, Angel, you mentioned special financing. Don't don't ever finance a $4,000 gaming PC. Don't. Not unless you realize how much the interest you're going to be paying on that gaming PC. Be very careful with financing something. Well, I mean, think about it this way. Three payments into it, and you're already behind the curve as far as technology goes, and you just barely chipped off the interest. Yeah. Well, that's like one of those things. Is, you know, the, one of my favorite things is you know, one of my cousins is like, yeah, I got a MacBook. It's awesome. I'm paying like thirteen dollars a month, and I'm like, how many decades are you paying thirteen dollars a month for? He's going to be paying for that MacBook by the time he's out of graduate school and has his first child. So he's gonna, you know, he's paying like literally like. $3,000 for a $1,500 computer. But he got his MacBook now, Patrick. Don't you, don't you well, understand? Well, okay, <laughs> anyhow, enough with the financial Dr. Phil Fura. <laughs> Should we talk about gaming PCs well, at the other end? At the other end, you know, if you're going to go sub $700, because we have a question from Zachary. He says, I'm fixing to purchase a new Dell Inspiron 518, and I'm trying to keep the budget under $700. I can't decide between a 2.53 gigahertz dual core E7200 with a Radeon HD 3450 GPU or a 2.4 gigahertz quad core Q6600 with integrated graphics, and that's the Intel GMA3100. So, should I choose the faster processor or the faster GPU? Either way, the system will have 500 gigabyte hard drive, 3 gigs of RAM, and Vista. Do you remember when value? PCs had crap parts in them. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know what I mean? It would be like the Celeron mutilated for slowness <laughs> combined with a half of a megabyte of RAM. Hey, you could overclock those celeries. And they'd give you a crayon so you could draw your own colors in on the monitor. And those are fast parts for a value machine. The big yeah. question is what do you want to use the PC for? Web serving and office applications, a home theater PC, 3D gaming. 3D gaming is going to be a stretch for either configuration because the graphics not so hot. If you're into gaming, go with the dual core and spend another 50 or 100 bucks on a faster graphics card like the Radeon 4850 or Nvidia's 9800. Now, the quad core processor Quad core processors in gaming, Garnet, thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> How about thumbs whichever way? I mean, come on, right now, quad cores, if you've, you've shown the benchmarks right. before, and you got and every time this comes up, people get upset because theoretically the quad core with a properly multi threaded game. What, what's that? What? <laughs> How many games are properly multi threaded these days? Uh, a small a, subset? A very small subset, right? So in most cases, the dual core is going to give you as much performance on the processor side. And actually, I mean, one of the arguments I'd have is you were talking about like buying more video card. I don't know. I mean, it's sort of tough if you start buying more and more pieces with those right. online configurators. You very quickly, it, it's that's how they lure you in, right? Right. It's like it's like lure. You know, it's like we talked about. You're going you're going into the car dealership to buy the Civic, and the next thing you know, you bumped it up into the. You're app. strong and powerful. You will not be lured. Neither will you. Right. The quad core processor. Mm, well, actually, it could be a winner if your apps support multiple threads, right? If you're if you're if some video work. Video work, or or actually a, a lot of actually, if you run a lot of applications simultaneously, especially if they're if you like to rip CDs while working in a, a gigantic three thousand cell spreadsheet while playing another, you know what I mean? It's like yeah, if where you like to have a lot of stuff running, quad core can be great because the operating system will basically parcel 
an application to each core sure. or, or a subset of each core to an application. Anyhow, quad cores are great if you do a ton of multitasking or you have multi-threaded applications. Okay, that totally makes sense. Yeah, our, our big question is if the Q6600 configuration doesn't offer a PCI Express slot because it has the integrated graphics. If it doesn't offer a PCI Express slot, you might want better graphics than the 3100 in the future for some reason, and that would kind of not be upgradable if there's no PCI Express slot, in which case you'd have to buy a new motherboard. I mean, upgradability is something to watch for if you're buying an inexpensive PC. Being able to add more storage and expansion cards is always a big plus in our book. But that was a pretty good configuration. He was saying he's getting a, great a 500 gigabyte hard drive, three gigabytes of RAM, and a fairly good dual core or quad core processor. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Intel's integrated graphic solutions. I mean, back in the day, they were especially dire. I mean, they've gotten much better, but I'm still not a big fan. Right. Plus, go like you said, go in with your eyes open, find out what kind of expansion slots you have in there. And Dell, fortunately, has moved away from those proprietary setups. Everybody's moved so, away from those proprietary setups. So you're probably, probably going to be able to upgrade. I like that thought. Hopefully, we've helped you decide. Look, the dual core is going to be fast enough for just about any. I just, that's, that's two really great configurations <laughs> for like not much money. I'm telling you, from our <laughs> earlier question, go look at that XPS uh, 6, 630. It's amazing, really. You'll be surprised at how low that stuff starts. I'm going to go look at that, but before I do, let's take a moment now for a message from the United States Air Force. All right, I couldn't resist taking a question about DirecTV's HVR20. It's one of their, well, it's basically their PVR, DVR, it's their HD, with their older high definition personal video recorder box thing. This is the first one I didn't upgrade to. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now now you can no longer really upgrade to this one. You'll, you'll get a better one. All right, well, that's a good deal. <laughs> Randy, though, has it, and he wrote in, and he says, I need more information on the DirecTV DVR. I have the DVR20 that has the 500 gigabyte drive. It also has USB, Ethernet, and eSATA, but I haven't found any information on their usage. Can you point me in the right direction? I'll sometimes record a marathon of old shows I like, but then I have to watch them and delete them pretty quickly before my drive fills up. And that's from Randy in Mississippi. I had mentioned having a 750 gigabyte drive, external drive on my right. DirecTV uh, uh, box last week, which is it's all of a sudden, we've never gotten DirecTV questions before and suddenly a flood comes in. It is time to become one with the forums, Randy, aka forums.directtv.com. There's a ton of good information there. There's people who live in these machines that will help you out. The eSATA port is the one you're going to be the most interested in. You can connect a much bigger external hard drive to that port. It will then replace, not add to it, essentially replaces the internal hard drive inside the DVR. So anything that's on that internal hard drive, you won't be able to access until you unplug the external drive. The Ethernet is there for DirecTV on demand. Free programming if you've got a good net connection, and in theory, so you can do media sharing with a PC with Intel's Vive. I'm curious if anyone's ever gotten that to run with any success, because most of the people I know have been pretty frustrated with it. I'm trying right now to get the new Direct2 PC beta software running, which is supposed to share everything I have on my Direct TV PVR with any of basically the PCs in the house. I just started playing around with that. That's actually a pretty cool use of the Ethernet port on there and a reason you might want to upgrade to HD <laughs> in the 21st century. The USB port has been reserved for future use since I think 2004. Um, someday they might do something with it. At this point, nobody's right, sure. found anything to do with it. Maybe they'll need to do a firmware upgrade and send a technician to your house instead of sending it over the satellite, right? Nobody, everybody thought it was gonna be for hard drives and it's, who knows? <laughs> so, that's pretty much the, the basic DirecTV hacks. Wow, so. that's a long list. There's always been a large community adding additional storage to those PBRs, though. I mean, that's been that's an honored tradition. Yeah. So I think if you go on the forums, you're going to find any questions will be not only answered, but there's a vigorous community that'll get right in there and start helping you and be excited to help you about and it's, it. And it's really a stretch to call it a hack, because basically it's like external drive with an eSATA port, plug yeah. it into the uh, plug oh, so it into the PBR. Back in the day when we were lifting the lids off. And hit the, the red off. button. This isn't as detailed as like no. lifting lids off the no. TiVo and patching in new software and adding the drives, all that stuff we used to do. It's really weird because it's really end user friendly. They just never talk about it anywhere in the in the PVR manuals oh, cool. from DirecTV. Well, good. They finally gave up on finding that. 
<laughs> hey, go figure. Hey, we got a good one about encrypting your drives in Vista. You want to fire this one? Absolutely. This is Sean. He writes in and says, can you please let me know if there's a way to password protect folders in Windows Vista without using a separate program? I know that it's possible in XP if you're using NTFS, but I can't seem to find a way to achieve the same results using Vista. I'd prefer not to have to zip folders and assign passwords, which is the workaround, and I don't want to create multiple users. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, remember all those different flavors of Vista? Right. Well, yeah. There's two of them that it works with. Yeah, well, here's the thing, right? What you're looking for is BitLock or drive encryption. And unless you have Vista Ultimate or Vista Enterprise or the oh so common in the home Windows Server 2008, you're not going to have it installed. In which case, you need to resort to a third party option, either commercial uh, or our personal favorite, our collective favorite here, an open source uh, program called TrueCrypt. You're going to get the same results in terms of securing your files. And in some cases, I think TrueCrypt's a little more flexible. Well, and it's open source, and we'd love to support the open source community. We so, do. Good stuff. So basically, either upgrade your operating system or download a free copy of TrueCrypt. Oh, we're almost to the end. Are you ready? No, let's keep going. <laughs> All right. Send us more questions. Fred, yeah, like he said, if you're watching, we love on your questions. You want to take the show on a new question, ask us a question. Tell us what you're curious about. Email us, techsellatrevision 3com Check out product reviews, how-tos. You ask us, we'll do it. Although we couldn't go to the SEMA show because we cut back on our travel spending. We will be going to CES. And in any case, we need your emails. Don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision 3com or even better, just send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of your family and friends when they see your mug on the show. Remember, just keep it to 15 seconds. Upload it to YouTube. No attachments. It's a very big deal. No attachments. I don't want Patrick getting hurt. He warned me about it. He says he gets hurt and it's, it's bad. Yeah, thing. key so department in the Just stick. make sure and put in the email video question in the subject line. And as always, visit the forums at revision3.com slash forum. You can find out more details on the website, techzilla.com. I want to spend, I want to spend, I want to extend this so laurel and hearty Handshake. Thanks for coming in, man. That Absolutely, dude. We would you come back what? in a couple weeks. Do you, you want to give us your picks, for like the Christmas gaming picks, the holiday gaming oh, picks, absolutely. the season gaming picks? Of course. Across like the PS3, the Xbox, the D. We just You're giving me a whole show for this. You gonna play some games? Are you gonna so hold a controller? <laughs> I will hold a control. You come by, or I will go to your office where you have 4,200 oh. consoles. Set us up in the demo room. I like that thought. We'll get we'll get Patrick rocking some Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Do you want to get the sort of holiday buying gaming review program thing from Garnet? Kick us an email, techsellatrevision.com. Dude, oneup.com is his website. Go there, learn lots about games because it is the word I cannot say on the show. Thanks again, dude. It was awesome having you. Absolutely. Love being here, man. Of course. We like that thought. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Garnet Lee. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Two, I couldn't resist taking one out of the mailbag. <laughs> Sorry, it just sounds so wrong. <laughs> couldn't resist taking a hit in the old mailbag. <laughs> couldn't resist dropping one off in the mailbag. <laughs> Special one for the postman who keeps giving me somebody else's mail. In three, two. Homestar Runner, I can't believe you just repped Homestar Runner in fall 2008. Come on, what is this, like 1999? Yet it's still fabulous. It is still okay. <gasps> He does have the answer for that? I have So I just don't understand the question because I'm stupid. Good to know. Let's go back to the top and I'll try asking that without getting confused. <laughs> Hi, does your challenge have that look like a deer in the headlamp? It's because <laughs> it's...